sang. All right, this is Iron Geek who's doing recording duties and about to speak, so I am going to move up to the podium very shortly. Hopefully, this is all actually recording. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Aiden Crenshaw, and I'm basically doing a fill-in talk because I never got to finish this when I tried to give the talk at Husek Khan. I only had 45 minutes, and I spent way too much time trying to cover things like um, how Tor basically works as opposed to spending time actually covering the topic of how people got caught. So this time around, I'm actually going to try to cover how people got caught instead. And Sennhauser microphone. These things are pretty nice, actually. Kind of expensive, but very nice if you have them. So the talk you're about to see is completely improvised. I haven't really practiced enough for it this particular time. I should have gone back and read through the articles. But since you're going to talk about how people got um, the docs dropped on dark nets, how people got caught, they're using these dark nets to anonymize themselves, be hidden. But how did people figure out who they were? Despite the fact that the whole point of not being caught is the whole reason you use a dark net. First of all, a little bit about me. My name is Aiden Crenshaw. I run IronGeek.com. Anybody been out to the website? Hello, folks. Uh, I have an interest in InfoSec education, but I don't know everything. I'm just a geek with time on my hands. Um, also, I'm a senior information security consultant at TrustedSec, and I'm also a co-founder of DerbyCon. So, a few things about perspective on this talk. <sighs> I have two different goals in this. There's certain people I want to be able to stay anonymized. Let's say political distance in countries where freedom of speech is limited. I want those people to be able to say what they want to say. However, there's other people I'm okay with being de-anonymized. Let's say um, pedophiles, for instance. I'm okay with people like those getting caught. That's fine and dandy with me. But the thing is, about any kind of privacy network, you, it's hard to help one side and not help the other, or hurt one side and not hurt the other. So I'm basically talking about how people got caught and how people can avoid getting caught. Unfortunately, it's, um, it's a double-edged sword when it comes to anonymity. Also, I'm not really a privacy guy. I'm one of those weirdos that kind of thought, if I could know everything about everyone, I probably would, because that's just the kind of person I am. Um, but I have an interest in how it all works. Basically, I'm a big old crypto weenie. I'm just interested in crypt uh, cryptography and networking and so forth, and that's the reason dark nets like I2P and Tor interest me. Also, I am not a lawyer, so any kind of thing I give here is not actually legal advice. Take it for what it is. Uh, if there is such a thing as a soul, I would hope I have one, so obviously I'm not a lawyer. And also, be careful where you surf. If you go ahead and look around these various dark nets, you got to be careful where you go because there are certain things you could pick up on your computer. I'm not talking about malware. I'm talking about contraband you don't really want to have on your machine. For instance, I know a security researcher who was doing stuff on de-anonymizing people on Tor. He was looking around and he saw someone had posted on a Chan site inside of um, a dark net a picture of him, his talk, or basically his um, a link to his article, and then right below that was a bunch of uh, child porn. So it's kind of, you got to be careful when you're moving around these things. And a lot of stuff, my understanding, I'm like, again, I'm not a, a lawyer, but a lot of stuff is strict liability. You don't want that contraband in your machine regardless. And you might want to surf with images off depending on where you go. I'm not trying to make it sound like everything on these dark nets is all CP and so forth. But there's enough out there that you want to be careful where you go. But it's still stuff, it's interesting to research. Um, a few old cases I covered in a previous version of this talk. There was the Howard bomb threat. Eldo Kim, essentially his screw up was he was one of the few people using Tor at his campus at the same time and as soon as the cops asked him about it, he admitted to it. He essentially called in a bomb threat, well, via email. They knew the person who sent it was um, using Tor because they could track it back to one of the exit nodes and he was one of the few people using Tor at the time. They questioned him and he just copped to it. He wanted to get out of taking an exam. Um, Lolsec with Hector. Uh, so essentially, uh, Sabu and Jeremy Hammond got caught because Sabu most of the time used Tor to connect to IRC, but one time screwed up and didn't. The one time he screwed up and didn't, they figured out who he was. Then he turned on everybody else, and eventually they found Jeremy Hammond. Jeremy Hammond consistently uses Tor, but they figured out the times where this particular actor in Lulsec, who was Jeremy Hammond, he, when he was on Tor, 
versus when Jeremy Hammond was at home, they were able to correlate timings and figured out it was him. You know, they got a pin device hooked up and they was able to eventually figure out who Jeremy Hammond was. Also, he leaked various things on, um, I think, IRC when he was talking to people over tour about um, where he'd been arrested or been in, in uh, detained before at various political activist meetings. And there's only so many people with his particular skill set and his particular politics out there. So it was pretty quick to figure out who he was. Freedom hosting, uh, Eric there. My understanding, he got caught maybe partly because they eventually found what service he was on and there was a money trail back to him and who was paying for the service. Because someone might buy virtual hosting someplace, set up tour on it, but if they trace it down to what the real servers are and then they capture those and then they figure out who's paying for them, well, they can figure out who's who. That's the old cases I covered in a previous talk. Now, right now, I'm going to skip past a whole lot of the background stuff because that's what took so much time during the previous talk. How many people here actually are familiar with Tor and I2P and how it works? You're familiar with Tor? You're familiar with Tor? For those who aren't, think about it this way. Tor and I2P are basically a series of proxies using multiple levels of encryption where you followed somebody into the darknet, you have multiple levels of proxying, each person has their own cryptographic key that they encrypt everything with, and so one person doesn't know who's talking to who, and no one can necessarily look at whose traffic is sending what until it gets to an exit point or it gets to its endpoint inside of the dark net. That's a massive oversimplification, but I'm doing an oversimplification because otherwise I have to go through all these slides, which take way too much time to go through, and that's what took up probably like 30 minutes of the last talk. Because I want to actually get to the part where people got caught, and I want to cover why people got caught. Oh, by the way, most of this is going to be about I2P because, sorry, most of this is going to be about Tor because not many people, at least not many, uh, Incidents that reach the news involve IGP. That's not because um, IGP is necessarily in completely inherently more secure than uh, Tor, but it's just not as popular as Tor. So, um, but a quick shout out to IGP. If you want to look for an alternative to Tor, IGP's focus is more internal. Oh crap! Yes, looks like you did. What did you try? What did you pull out? What are you, what are you pulling? Is that power for you? No. Yeah. Power cord. Oh, how this all got tangled up so badly. All right, um, something of mine got unplugged. Power. Yeah, that has to stay plugged in. Apologize. Project computer, project video. All right, let me go check my recording feed to make sure it's still recording. Wait, stayed up or did it come back up? All right, let me know if it actually advances to the next slide when I advance. It was on the... That's weird. Actually, no, in the second part, that's not so weird. Did it advance in a second? I really don't have the time to cover Bitcoin, by the way. This gets way more complicated. Uh, check out Bob Weiss's talk. I have it at that particular link. And a version of these slides are online someplace or another if you go Googling around for them or look at my um, Twitter feed. But a lot of these um, sites I'll be talking about actually accepted Bitcoin as the rate of currency. So. First of all, I'm going to cover a bit of stuff I, I did cover in a previous talk. and uh, But there was more information that came to light of Silk Road after the court case came through and so forth. So, a little bit about Silk Road. This was case three, I believe, in my original talk. So, I basically have expanded from my original talk and will cover two new cases once we get a little bit further in. All right, someone going by the handle of Dread Powered Roberts was an operator of the Silk Road, which allows sellers to buy and exchange less than legal goods and services. Most of this involved in drugs, and it was available at that particular URL. But that particular URL you see there, that is generated because there's a tool called Scallion where you can brute force um, potential onion names. Normally, the onion name would be a completely random thing, but if you only want to uh, brute force the first few characters of it, 
you can do that. I'm guessing there's going to be something that um, decreases your anonymity from doing that. But regardless, that was the particular um, name they were using for a while. And from the court documents, they sold all sorts of stuff. So we, cannabis, dissociatives, ecstasy, intoxicants, so on and so forth. I think there was also maybe some hitman services out there. There's a few things you couldn't sell, strangely enough. Like, I want to say you couldn't sell fake diplomas. I mean, you could sell fake IDs and so forth. So I'm not sure why fake diplomas was one of the things you supposedly couldn't sell. But there was a lot of various things that would be um, illegal or pseudo-illegal out there. So with about 1.2 billion in exchanges on the Silk Road, the FBI, FBI wanted to know who was behind this, obviously. And they started to look for the earliest references to Silk Road on the public internet. One of the key things you should take away from this when it comes to darknets like Tor and ITP, most people aren't getting caught because of technological blunders. They're getting caught because of bad OPSEC, because of leaking crap on the internet, saying too much stuff. Things that are basically... It's not so much the core technology itself, sometimes it's application security on the, on the clients. Like someone was saying a few years ago, people aren't necessarily hacking the servers, they're hacking the clients, because ultimately, if you can get someone to click on some silly stuff, as, uh, well, Boris Zelvik, am I pronouncing that right? Awesome. Boris, who um, can't make it this particular year, a jaded security, uh, as he's fond of saying, don't click shit. Most of uh, the people who got de-anonymized on Tor, it's been either application security stuff or it's been, or, well sorry, endpoint application security stuff or just bad OPSEC. So, you know, FBI went out looking for the earliest stuff on the internet they could find related to uh, the Silk Road. And they found this particular post on Shroomery where someone said, I came across this website called Silk Road. It's a Tor hidden se service that claims to allow you to buy and sell online anonymously. I'm thinking of buying on it. But wanted to see if anyone here had heard if it or could rec oh, sorry had heard of it and could recommend it. And he points out the way you can find it and uh, let me know what you think. I sense the entire thing is written as someone who's already involved with the site, and the person who posted it was going by the handle Altoid. Okay. Also on Bitcoin Talk, someone had posted this particular little entry. Also is Altoid. What an awesome friend. You guys have a ton of great ideas. Has anyone seen Silk Road yet? It's kind of an anonymous Amazon.com. And I don't think they have hair in there, but they're selling other stuff. Basically, they basically use Bitcoin and a Tor to broker anonymous transactions. It's at, and he gives the URL for it. Those not familiar with Tor can go to Silk Road 420 WordPress.com for instructions on how to access the Onion site. Let me know what you guys think. So, Altoid is pretty well tied to this. He's the first person to post about it. The first person to post about it online might very well be the organizer of it. And pardon me, while well, I tie my shoes so I don't trip on myself. I don't plan on doing a whole lot of roaming while I'm talking, but... So... These various posts come up. Altoid is very well tied to it. So, let's find out more about Altoid eventually. So eventually on the Bitcoin forums, someone starts also asking for uh, an out for someone who uh, is a Bitcoin expert to help him with some work he's doing. And he posts his actual Gmail address that happens to have his full first name and last name in it. So I'll tell you this one, the first guy who ever seems to mention Bitcoin on the internet. If you do a Google search, you can do a time search. Which actually is some really fascinating stuff. You go into it. Sometimes the dates are off, but regardless, it's kind of you can find some interesting information. So he's one of the first guys on the internet who ever mentions to, mentions uh, the Silk Road, and then he ties his real first name and his real last name via a Gmail address to these posts and the username Altoid, which he used on these Bitcoin forums. Yeah, that's a good idea. So. If you go looking on Silk Road, you can find that the guy going by Dread Pirate Roberts had an interest in the uh, Mrs. Institute. And it's a school of um, Austrian economics. It's very, um, I'm trying to think how to say it. Oh, I don't, I don't think, um, 
anarcho-capitalism may be quite right. Libertarian capitalism. Anyway, it's very free market. It's uh, probably only, you know, so many people are hugely interested in this. Both him and this Ross Obert guy had an interest in this. So that kind of tied them together. And Dread Pirates Robert Signature on Silk Roads had information about the Mises Institute as well. So both his, like, public uh, social media network stuff had that information in it. He was interested in it. So was this Dread Pirate Roberts guy. So that kind of tied them together as well. Also, Ross, the Ross Ulbrich account that was on Stack Overflow was asking for help for PHP code to connect Tor and hidden services together. Uh, his username quickly changed to Frosty. That comes into play later on. But for a short time, this Ross Ulbrich guy was asking about these things. And by the way, some of this code that he was asking about, he posted, eventually got found on the Silk Road servers. Now, granted, some code is obviously going to look the same no matter where it's at. There's only so many ways to do a certain thing. But it's... Oh, death by a thousand paper cuts. Okay, this isn't even paper cuts. This is like cardboard cuts. It's um, pretty bad. So you can guess who's going to be the main suspect after all this very bad OPSEC. And that is the facial expression I would have if I was in his particular situation. So, other problems end up happening for poor Ross, or not so poor Ross, depending on your perspective. Uh, the post office started to receive all sorts of packages with drugs in them. And we're like, what the hell's going on? We're getting a whole lot more of this than we normally see. Uh, Homeland Security start, created this operation called Marco Polo and to look into this. Carl Force, a.k.a. Um, Nob, alias Alado Guzman, uh, he was a DA agent who went undercover and pretended to be a drug dealer on the Silk Road to try to get some people into his confidence, get a little bit more information. Because really, if you look into his case and uh, Jeremy Hammond's case and so forth, a lot of these people just say too much about themselves. Now, the Jeremy Hammond case I covered in a previous version of this talk where I covered over ca older cases. This one, I covered the Silk Road in the previous talk also, but not in as much detail as I have, hopefully, in this one. <sighs> While... Uh, Carl was doing his thing. Carl was doing his thing. There was a particular gentleman who was working for Ross Ulbrich. Basically, he farmed out some of the admin work and some of the um, end user support to other people. One of them was Curtis Green, and he helped around on the surf road as a customer service provider. He went by the name Flush or Chronic Pain. Well, eventually, um, to make sure that he had felt a little bit more secure. Dread Pod Roberts asked for scans of people's driver's license who were going to be admins on a site. Giving that kind of information up is probably a bad scene regardless. But, I mean, if you're making a few thousand dollars a month off of this because it's your side uh, work, eh, you might be willing to do that. Also, Dread Pod Roberts eventually asked Green to help facilitate a transaction, but it was with an undercover agent. My understanding with Call of Force. Call of Force. And uh, when that happened, well... Really bad things happen. So Green received a package that let off a cloud of white powder when he opened it. This was in one of my articles. It wasn't clear if it exploded or if it was just all powder. And it's like, <laughs> and apparently it was actual drugs, if I remember how the article was written. And this was just before the SWAT and the DEA agents landed on him. So essentially what happened, if I understand the way the article is describing it, Call of Force had basically um, cursed Dread Pirate Roberts into facilitating a transaction between him and Green so he could actually bust one of their admins. And once you have one of their admins, if they have a little bit more resources on the server, it doesn't take long to figure out maybe what the server is and where it's actually located. Anyway, Green gets landed on by Carl, and uh, DPR, Dread Pride Robbers, noticed the absence of Green out there. He wasn't able to, you know, do his normal job. He also did a Google search that showed that Green was arrested, and about uh, $350,000 in Bitcoin came up missing in Flush's name, as someone who transferred that out. Yeah, this by the way comes into further details because Carl gets into a little bit of trouble a bit later because apparently he was um, uh, dipping into other people's pockets. But regardless, because of what Carl did, it looks like, and again, I'm not a lawyer, and I may be misunderstanding this, so I don't want to be sued for any kind of defamation. For the articles I've read, it seems like Carl kind of set Green up to be in a really bad situation, which we'll talk about in a second. So, Carl Force, again, a.k.a. Knob, 
alias Elado Guzman. He was a DEA agent and he was pretending to be a drug dealer. So DPR, even though he was the one that set all this crap in motion, DPR, Red Power Roberts, contacted him about setting up a hit on Green. So, you know, he basically put Green in this situation in the first place, especially the whole $350,000 just went missing. I'm like, yeah, that's not good. So, to make everything kind of seem copacetic, they faked a torture image of Green and sent this to Dread Pirate Roberts. Apparently, there's a few other admins that got turned along the way, like a guy named Cyrus. Um, Secret Service agent uh, Sean Bridges and Carl Force of the DEA were later caught um, stealing Bitcoin using the admin account of Flush, and they used this during the investigation to change using sorry, change user passwords. I believe they may have stolen from other people as well who are on the counts. Regardless, because they already had a little bit of insider information, I guess maybe because they thought everything was virtual, they would never get caught. But um, I think maybe the legal things against. Um, Bridges and force may still be ongoing, but basically they um, they dipped their hands into the candy jar a little bit there. As Tarbell said, he I think he was the chief FBI agent in charge of the case. It's as if you found out at the end of Breaking Bad that Hank was dirty the whole time. Again, I've not really um, practiced this before today. I should have practiced more immediately before today. I just figured I'd take this opportunity to complete the talk I didn't get to finish previously. So. Someone was, was connecting to the server that actually held S Silk Road. How do you initially found the Silk Road server? If I understand it correctly, there was something screwed up about the capture, and you sent the right input to it, you'd get an error message back, and the error message involved some of the IPs that were actual real public internet IP addresses. This is, you know, basically it wasn't something in Tor that got busted, it was just application security issues that got busted. Uh, and when someone visited this particular website that they that was one of these IP addresses, they got back the same capture that was on uh, the Silk Road. Uh, many years ago, I want to say it was 2010 or 2011, I did a talk on um, I2P. In I2P, by default, most of you are routers. So what I did was I requested that particular I2P website, something that I2P from every single IP address I knew to be inside the ITP network. And I modified my host parameter in HTTP to say, I want this particular .ITP address. And occasionally, one of those IP addresses would actually return the same web page as a particular ITP site. At that point, I was pretty damn sure I knew which IP address really hosted the site. So ideally, if these people had set things up to where you have to have a certain valid host name before it return that particular site, it would have been a lot better off. Also, various things that uh, Dread Pirate Roberts said seem to indicate that he lived in the uh, Pacific time zone, and it's already known that Ross lived in San Francisco. So, the IP of the Silk Road server was attached to uh, via a VPN server that was connected to by an IP belonging to an internet cafe on Laguna Street in San Francisco from which Ulbrich had uh, also connected to his Gmail account, both on June 3rd, 2013. So this particular cafe, someone had attached to the actual server that Silk Road was run on, which I believe they found via some kind of <sighs> application problem on the server itself. And this IP had also attached to Ross Ulbrich's Gmail account. So that's something else that ties to him. Uh, a PM to Dread Pirate Roberts from a user said that the site was leaking some sort of IP address belonging to the VPN. Apparently, this was on a Reddit thread too. And I believe that's the Reddit thread that was talking about it. So, because of various application security problems on the site itself, they figured out where the machine was. <sighs> FBI agent Christopher Tarber tried to cause an error by tossing various things at the Silk Road. One of the things I normally do on any kind of web application pen test I throw single quotes, dashes, any maybe weird Unicode, anything I can do to get an error, because sometimes an error message will tell you things. Now, in the case of most websites, having its real IP doesn't give me good information, because I can usually NS look up that. Telling me an internal IP address, while I may report it in a report, yeah, it doesn't really give you a whole lot of information. But when it comes to anonymity and trying to stay private on Tor and ITP, that shit means a whole lot.
Um, so they found out this particular IP address. It was at the Ford Data Center in Reykjavik, Iceland. And it also, when they requested that particular IP address in a browser, the same capture that was for Silk Road came up. That goes back to my talk about I2P, where when I requested that particular host name across all those IP addresses, even though it wasn't a valid host name for the public internet, it was something that I2P, it would return it because the way the web server was configured. So it was like, okay, this is part of the I2P of the actual Tor server. Let's go confiscate it and take a look around the server. And if I understand how it was working, I think it had um, <sighs> raid disks and set up in such a way that it was completely um, parallel. So they'd be able to just pull out a disk and take it and not necessarily have downtime, if I understand how they ho had it hooked up. Regardless, they were able to get an image of it. So the FBI starts taking down Silk Road servers. I'm not sure how they found it, but the thing I described previously is probably how they did it. It could also have been a money trail to aliases. Um, or as Nicholas Reeves projected, they hacked Silk Road and made it a contact to the outside server without using Tor, so it revealed its IP addresses. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, once located, FBI was able to get a copy of the servers. So, a few things. One thing, and they found this out later when um, Ross's laptop was confiscated, Ross kept a diary and log of sorts of what all he was doing online. Apparently, a few things were going on, like those are protection rackets that was getting around, I believe it was 50,000 per week uh, to not DOS the site. Also, in May 13, attackers... Um, man, I need to check my grammar next time I do one of these talks. Uh, May 13, attackers had kept the, sound that, the, the site down for like a week. So he was getting extorted from other people uh, to get money from him because of... Uh, they are like, well, you know... You're underground, I'm underground, let's make some money. Anyway, user-friendly canvas apparently also hacked a user named uh, Lucy Drops system and got a list of users and emails and tried to blackmail Ross. Ross tried to uh, hire a user named Red and Right to kill friendly chemists. Later, uh, friendly chemist's associate, Tony76, uh, and housemates, and also other scammers. There were various people apparently who would um, build up a little bit of reputation on Silk Road selling drugs, and then all of a sudden, like, they would sell a bunch of drugs, get the money, or bitcoins, and walk away and leave. And then create new accounts. Because, in their opinion, why not? And apparently, Ross had hired out a bunch of hits on these people. To my knowledge, none of these deaths actually happened. Uh, much like the Green case, there may have been some fake photos. Uh, some of the chats seem to allude that there were fake photos sent. But apparently, the various names that... Um, Ross had given these people, say, hit this particular person, no one could find a death tied to that particular name. So, to our knowledge, no one actually got killed, but there were certainly some hits that were called. Another thing that tied all this to Ross, and you can see this is a death by, like I said, a thousand uh, cardboard cuts. At one time, uh, let's see, in, on 7-10-2013, U.S. Customs intercepted nine IDs with different names, but all of them having a picture of Ulbrich. Homeland Security interviewed Ulbrich, but he denied having ordered them. Now, this is the first bright thing he did. When, in, and like again, I'm not trying to say I'm supporting these people who, you know, but when dealing with the cops and you actually are a criminal, it is, or even if you're not a criminal in many cases, the best thing you can do is keep your mouth shut and don't say anything. And he mostly did that. Mostly. Um, smart. Obrick generally refused to answer any questions pertaining to the purchase of this or other counterfeit identity documents. I think I pulled this off of a wire article. I'm checking remember the original author who wrote that line. I think I have it in the credits here in a bit. So, that was a smart thing. He generally kept his mouth shut. The stupid. However, Obrick volunteered that, hypothetically, anyone could go onto the website named Silk Road on tour and purchase any drugs or fake identity documents the person wanted. If you're the guy actually running Silk Road, why would you tell Homeland Security about this information? Why would you say, you know, theoretically, anybody could get this. Also, if you were someone else who was ordering these, why would you get old books picture on them? Like, let's say I want to order fake IDs. You know, like I want to say, claim that I'm 21 and I'm not. Why would I order them with someone else's pictures on them? It made no sense whatsoever. So why he volunteered this information? No idea. Also, another strange thing, the roommates he was living with knew him as Josh, and uh, PM showed Dread Pirate Roberts was also interested in getting fake IDs. So, more things that tied him to him. 
Oh, remember how I mentioned that on um, Stack Overflow, he changed his name from Ross Ulbricht to Frosty? <sighs> Apparently, one of the Silk Road servers actually used SSH keys that ended in Frosty at Frosty. So that's another thing that ties to him. Also, eventually on um, 2010, oh, sorry, October 1st, 2013, the FBI landed on him in a library right after he entered his password into his laptop. And what they did was, strange enough, they, I think they staged a fight between a man and a woman behind him or something to get him distracted. And it's like, these people are like, Wah, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's like, what's going on? And then someone else reaches up, grabs his laptop, and walks off with it and makes sure it doesn't lock. Because he apparently was using full hard drive encryption, but someone was able to grab the machine and walk off of it. The Jeremy Hammond case I mentioned before, and did in more detail in the previous version of this talk. Jeremy Hammond apparently did get his laptop shut before anybody else could get to it. Oh, great. The guy from Freedom Hosting I mentioned before, him, he was said to have dived for his laptop, but didn't quite make it. So a lot of these cases, you know, to really get all the evidence, they have to get to the laptop. And these people who were really bright about it, they were like, they staged a the fight behind them, and then, while he was distracted, grabbed the <laughs> laptop. And he got caught really dead to rights. Uh... He apparently, and this is uh, irony of it, he'd been downloading the previous night's uh, Cobalt Report interviewing Vince Gillian, the creator of Breaking Bad, just after the series finale. So, yeah, if you ever watch that series, it's a great series, um, but it's some interesting um, irony there. Anyway, uh, when caught, Obik supposedly said to Tarbell, I don't suppose 20 million can get me out of this. Another dumb thing to say. I uh, see. Claim was made by Ulbricht's attorney that Ulbricht had started uh, Silk Road 1.0, but sold it off quickly. However, he kept this journal on his laptop, which they were able to get to unencrypted, that seemed to detail a lot more than that. Um, also, Assistant U.S. Attorney uh, Sarah Turner has said, uh, there's no dispute when the defendant was arrested, he was logged into as the Dread Powered Roberts. I think his defense attorneys, and again, I'm not a lawyer, I may have this information wrong, don't want to be sued for slandered by anybody, but my understanding is that they portrayed it in the defense that, okay, I started the site, someone else was dread part of Roberts for a while, then I came back. It didn't really fly. So, Ubik ended up re receiving a life sentence, and if you want to know more information about this, um, big thanks to Nate Anderson who wrote an article, I believe that was for Ars Technica. Very good article on that, and also I read a lot of stuff that Agent Christopher Kent, uh, Tarbell wrote for the court docs. That's where I got a lot of details from this stuff. But I have a bunch of URLs out there if you want to read more information on this. This is kind of a fascinating case. But let's talk about lessons learned from uh, Silk Road 1.0. Keep online identities separate. Different usernames, different locations. If they want to be able to tie things to, oh, he's this guy living on the West Coast in this particular location, it would have made it less likely to investigate him privately. Also, if he kept using names separate, like all the posts he made from Altoid, they connected Altoid to his actual real name via Gmail, and Frosty was both a name that he had on Stack Overflow and also on the server itself when it caught it. That would have helped his case somewhat. Also have a consistent story, having a different name amongst your roommates versus what the cops come looking for you under didn't help. Uh, don't talk about your interest. If he wasn't tied to the Mises Institute, that would help somewhat. You know, if, he, if him and Silk and the Dread Pirate Roberts didn't seem to be the same person, that could have helped. And also, don't volunteer information. Why the hell he told Department of Homeland Security that theoretically anybody could buy these fake IDs off the Silk Road? And he was running Silk Road. That was a stupid. And um, also, don't keep a diary or log of your criminal activity. Never a bad thing to do. Next case I want to talk to Bob is um, Tim um, DeFoggy. Now, he was a former acting uh, cybersecurity director of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So in theory, this guy should know about security, right? He should understand information security, computers, and whatnot. Well, FBI was running an operation called Torpedo. And Tim appeared to be uh, pardon me, a user of Pedalbook. This was something that was ran by uh, Aaron McGrath and sometimes you, this Tim apparently sometimes used the name of PT Ass Eater. Yeah, we won't go into what exactly that means, but um, anyway, 
Amograph's site had been seized by the FBI in 2012, and so they modified it to get more information on people. They installed what some people refer to as a network investigation tool, and um, it would phone home to the FBI and tell them information about the clients that visited. Tim's home connection was confirmed to be using Tor. This is easy enough. If you can just sniff the connection coming from his home, you can see what um, boxes he's talking to. You may not necessarily know what data he's sending on the Tor, but you can tell that he's using Tor because you look into the directory servers, which granted I didn't cover in this particular version of the talk because I had to skip all that for the save time. But if you can query those, you can know what directory servers he's probably talking to and figure out okay this person's on tour. There's exceptions to that like if you're using um, bridge nodes but that's in a previous version of this talk. Anyway they figured out he was using tour and they also his home IP that he used to access the AOL account he had an AOL account apparently called PT Ass Eater also. So again he was tying a username used inside of tour to a username he also used on the public internet via AOL. Anyway a little bit about Operation Torpedo. Uh, information returned from Operation Torpedo, the little knit they installed on people, it was the, the computer's actual IP address and the date and time that the knit determined that the IP address was a unique identifier generated by the knit and a series of numbers, letters, or special characters. Uh, my understanding is this particular knit was based on Rapid7's decloaker. Have you ever used decloaker? It's kind of interesting. They stopped, uh, I think, uh, HD Moore stopped development a while back. Yeah. Moore had stopped the work on it in 2011 since most users were using the Tor browser bundle. But the whole point of using the Tor browser bundle is you can configure Tor yourself and use any browser you want to point to it and stay anonymized, supposedly. But if there's problems with your application, like let's say you have an outdated version of the browser and someone's able to use an exploit in it, they can make you contact a server outside of the Tor network and still figure out who you are. Anyway, this guy was probably not using the Tor browser bundle. Apparently, uh, this knit uh, used Java, JavaScript, and Flash. It did not necessarily have to install any real malware. I think those other knits in the past that have used real malware as in some kind of executable that gets on your machine. You want more information on Decloaker? You can still find it out on archive.org. Anyway, they used this and they were able to find out his real IP address. Uh, there was also been previous uh, nits out there like there was a payload called Magneto which phoned home to service in Virginia using the host's IP address. You can find information about that out there on uh, the URL I present. It also reported back the computer's MAC address, uh, Windows host name and a unique serial number to tie it to the user to a site. I've seen a different one, I think this was leaked in some of the Snowden documents called Egotistical Giraffe. Um, and a few other ones that have been used in the past, like Magic Lantern, Fox Acid, and uh, Sipav. Oh, by the way, if you get a chance to see a talk by Joe Cicero, I don't know if it's ever been recorded. Privacy in a Surveillance State, Evading Detection, check it out. He's talking a little bit about also these kind of uh, nits that people get installed in their boxes that they're being investigated. But to give you an idea how these things work, essentially, Tor, everything should route information through the Tor network. However, if you can find some kind of exploit or get something like uh, Flash to run and the Flash doesn't necessarily respect the Tor protocol and tries to access things outside on the public internet, you can serve some, somebody something and then have that something try to contact you outside. So let's say it's a hidden service. You can send an exploit or payload to it and then have it try to contact you outside on the public internet. So let's say you found some kind of um, oh my uh, MSSQL injection on a Tor hidden service. There's no reason you couldn't use something like set to send an exploit to it and then say contact me back on this IP address and it might very well likely do that. This would be one of the reasons to use a tool along the lines of, um, well, I think I have it in a, in a bit here, but um, Tails. The, uh, how was it? The amnesic. The amnesic something, some incognito live system? Uh, Linux system? system? Yes, basically something that is designed to not only have the Tor browser running and various things in the application layer stopping things, but also in the network layer say, 
Nothing gets out unless it's over Tor. Another thing that people screw up if they don't use the Tor browser bundle or they don't configure the browser properly is DNS leaks. By default, if you're doing DNS lookups with Firefox, it, even if you're using a proxy, it requests whatever DNS servers are con configured for its DNS. Well, here's the problem with that. Let's say you're requesting a .onion site. What it will do is it will request from your ISP what onion site you're accessing. So let's say Silk Road something 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 .onion. So while your ISP won't see the traffic you're sending to that Onion site, they will see that you requested its IP because DNS goes out. Tor browser button is automatically configured by default to request all DNS entries go through the Tor network. So a few things we can learn from um, Tim's case. Don't be a pedophile, first of all. Uh, use the Tor browser bundle because apparently from what I've read of how he got caught, he apparently didn't. Um, also, don't enable Flash, Word docs, don't open up HTA files, etc. because it's a good way of getting malware or having something served to you where they can make a connection out over the public internet and figure out who you really are. Next case is Blake Bentall and Operation Onibus. All right, around October 7th, uh, conversations had started about making a replacement for Silk Road 1.0. One person invited to the conversations was an undercover Homeland Security investigator. And eventually, he became hired as an admin on Silk Road 2. So from the very beginning, Silk Road 2 already had a government agent involved in it. So Silk Road 2.0 began operation on November 6, 2013, and it was started by Dread Pirate Roberts 2. And as an all, sorry, as an all's technical interview said, there's only one person in the world that knows who I am. My second command, DEFCON, is me. So, unless the feds have me, they can never take down the road. Because as soon as I am missing, he knows to just move servers and hit the kill switch on my access. Just think how much the FBI will be scrimming if, in those seats and red-faced again if they could arrest the Dread Pirate Robins and the road continues to function in her face. Oh, sure, I'm just going to continue. Um, if anyone wants to leave for lunch break, go have it. I'm just recording the talk, so I figured I'd finish it. Okay. All right, December 20th, 2013, the United States Attorney Office uh, for the Southern District of the New York announced that the rest of the three alleged administrators of the Silk Road 1.0, and that was those particular names of those people. And at this point, the Dread Pirate Roberts 2 comes up missing. So the question that's coming up is that one of these three guys... However, he eventually does come back. Uh, the second command, DEFCON, posted the following exchanges. Three of our dear friends were arrested in, in connection with the Silk Road 1.0 activities. They did not have access to anything which would compromise the marketplace. We are watching everything very closely, regardless. Then on December 22nd, the captain is alive and well and is in touch with key staff members. I cannot reveal much, but there are key f right, here are the key facts. Dread Pirate Roberts places operational security above all else, including posting updates to this forum. Given his role, he has every right to play it very safe. So the kind of question becomes, was the Dread Pirate Roberts 2.0 involved in the original Silk Road in some way? Was he one of those players that was arrested? Uh, it has been over 24 hours since uh, we last heard from our captain. He is almost certainly in grave danger. As a second command, I have very clear instructions as to what to do in the worst case scenario. I cannot elaborate on the specifics, but the marketplace is safe in my hands until the captain returns or his successor appears. Anyway, a little bit more information about Blake here. Blake is the alleged operator of Silk Road 2.0 who took over from Dread Pirate Roberts 2 in late December 2013. Some, some of the things I read, and a lot of this is conjecture, maybe one of those free guys arrested might have been the Dread Pirate Roberts 2.0, and had to say, okay, I'm being investigated, I gotta back off, this is all yours now. Not 100% sure on this. Uh, conversations were still taking place in January between Blake and uh, Dread Pirate Roberts 2.0. Uh, on January 28th, uh, DPR2 indicated a desire to withdraw completely, fearing he'd be arrested. And Blake uh, Ben Hall apparently used. Uh, Damn, I really need to uh, proofread these things more. Use his own email address, uh, blakebinhall.net, 
with the service provider when renting the service for Silk Road 2.0. Why are you going to run an illegal operation on virtual hosting or whatnot and put your real name tied to it? I do not know. But uh, anyway, apparently he did. IPAs associated with the administration of Silk Road 2.0 uh, were tied to the email address and also hotels Bent Hall had st uh, stayed at. Similar things also happened with um, Ulbrich. Basically, instead of contacting and administering the server through Tor, they did it directly over the public internet. So they were to tie what IP addresses were administering the server with IP addresses that these particular individuals had access to and were using. I can understand why they, these guys did that, because administering anything over Tor, using anything that's interactive over Tor, it's one thing to web browse around Tor, but using SSH over Tor, or let's say a remote desktop, or X over Tor, it is ugly. So I understand why they did that, but that did help tie things to them. On November 6, 2013, um, a Twitter post from him, uh, all this talk about the Silk Road being back up makes me want to uh, watch The Princess Bride. Eh, a little bit of information tied to him. In late January of 2013, he made a $70,000 uh, down payment on a Tesla Model S. Well, this guy previously didn't have nearly that amount of money. So, in like a matter of a couple months, he went from someone who wasn't making that much to someone who can drop 70k on a Tesla? That might tie some information to him. That Department of Homeland Security agent uh, could see a version info and uh, platform from about Ben Hall's browser when he used... Oh, sorry. The Department of Homeland Security guy could see information because uh, he was also uh, like a customer support guy, he could see platform information about Brent Hall's browser wh when he was uh, visiting the user support page. So if it wasn't anonymized and like very generic, he probably wasn't using the Tor browser bundle while he was visiting that support page. Because the Tor browser bundle in and of itself tries to make everybody who's using the Tor browser bundle look the same. And apparently he had fairly unique information. Also, he was not using access or Tor to access the support interface. Eventually, there was enough things to tie stuff to Blake that uh, they got a pin register on his internet connection and they figured out he was using Tor and um, Ben Hall's comings and goings from where he was living were tied to uh, DEF CON's time on Silk Road 2.0. On September uh, 11th, 2000, wait, September 10th, 11th, I have two different dates in there. Uh, DEF CON let his staff know around 10th and 11th, um, DEF CON let his staff know that the site had been hacked and a Bitcoin stolen. Apparently, $1.4 million worth of. Damn, that's a lot. And in late May, a ho the hosting server was imaged by uh, authorities and uh, the downtown was noticed by DEF CON. All of a sudden, you notice that, oh crap, uh, the servers are down for a bit. Is something going on? This is kind of suspicious. And uh, during Operation Omnibus, uh, for, sorry, 414 dot .onion domains were seized, including the Silk Road 2.0. On November 5th, 2014, uh, Bent Hall was arrested, and conjecture is that the relays nodes along the path were DOSed, causing a pattern that could be seen. Essentially, I'll have an illustration of that in a graphic here shortly. This uh, attack may have possibly used abuse of the introduce, sorry, the introduce message. Uh, some people at Carnegie Mellon had uh, done some research on this and were going to present it at Black Hat 2014, but the talk got cancelled. You can look up Tor Ticket uh, 15463 if you want to know more information about it. Apparently, there's a new Silk Road out there though already called Silk Road Reloaded that's now an I2P network instead of Tor. I haven't really looked too much into it, so as far as I know, that one could already be down. But there's all sorts of other um, dark place markets out there as well, like Agora and so forth. Um, if you want more information on that, here's a good document for you. A little bit more about correlation of endpoints. There's a few ways you can do it. One way is if you can monitor enough in the network, you can notice when someone sends a certain amount of data into it and out of it. While it might be all encrypted and have different keys every point along the way, if you see like about 15 megs go out this one way and 8 megs come back this other certain direction, it's always through the same pipes. You can kind of do um, signals intelligence and figure out who may be talking to who. There's also timing correlation of when data gets sent. So one idea is to 
do a, a DOS attack along the path and try to add a little bit of timing, like oh, I'm doing a DOS attack now. Are things slow down? Stop doing a DOS attack. Okay, I figured out you're taking this path. Let me try to trace that back to who's talking to who. Pulse the flow of the data if you're one of the people who happens to be along the path. Uh, even just change the load in the path. Anyway, lessons learned from Blake here. Don't connect your name to anything. Like, don't buy the servers in your own name if you're going to be running illegal stuff on them. Trust no one. For instance, if they hadn't had a federal agent already involved in Silk Road 2.0 from the very beginning, he may not have got caught. Use the Tor browser bundle. If he hadn't administrated things over the public internet and instead administrated everything over Tor, that'd be one less thing to tie to him. Uh, don't buy flashy stuff. If all of a sudden you go from, um, well, I'm not sure how poor he was originally, but I'm guessing that someone his age can't normally drop 70k as a down, oh, sorry, as a partial down payment on a Tesla. Yeah, uh, that's kind of suspicious. And uh, also, be paranoid about downtime. Once he knows it's the downtime, it might have been time to back away because he knows, oh crap, someone may have the servers, may be investigating. Crud, this is not a good scene. Side stuff, if anyone wants to do more research on uh, Tor and Darknets and so forth, there's some stuff I need to do a little more looking into. Apparently, the feds tried to subpoena Reddit uh, in an effort to learn about users behind the dark web um, uh, subreddits on there. And all technical has an article about that. Demos, don't really have time for demos, don't plan on do it. But if you want more information on how dark nets work, I have a show me con uh, talk from a while back. I also have a DEF CON version out there. That's basically part one of this talk. I also have a talk on dark nets in general where we talk about setting them up and so forth and what they are. Uh, the ITP FAQ is out there if you want to learn more about how ITP works. There's also the Tor FAQ, Tor manual, and um, a bunch of information on how to get on these various dark nets. I have like a free hour class about setting up Tor and I2P if you want to go check that out. Also have my Tor and I2P notes for text notes that basically cover this class. Um, I did a talk a while back on attack strategies where I go into more details about how someone could try to de-anonymize somebody. And I have some old videos of mine about basically using Tor, some stuff about setting up hidden services. Um, some stuff about de-anonymized people using things like the cloaker and uh, so on and so forth. Quick announcement, DerbyCon next year should be happening September 20th through 2006. And if you have a good con to check out, are Louisville InfoSec, SkydowCon, GurCon, CircleCityCon, and ShowMeCon. And that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? Sorry if that was a little bit ill-prepared. I wasn't expecting to give this talk, but I figured I had the time and um, I had a camera, so I might as well. Any questions? All right then. Well, I thank you very much for your time, and uh, you all enjoy lunch. I'm gonna go up and eat some Mexican. Which talk? Uh, actually, this one got by. Uh, I got a little bit more time to cover it, but I don't remember everything from what I read. And I have notes on there, but I hate to read all my slides, but yeah. there's so many freaking details involved. Oh, yeah. You gotta have good